Hello, and welcome to the PeopleSoft Innovation Summit and Zero Trust Remote Authentication for PeopleSoft. Uh, today, John Bazzoni from Duo will be presenting. Uh, my name is Scott Lavery, the head of marketing for Appsian. I'd like to thank you for your participation in the summit today. Uh, just a few quick housekeeping notes before we kick off, uh, and that's everyone is on mute. So the session is being recorded and will be posted to the registration landing page for free on-demand viewing within the next week. Uh, the session today will be 45 minutes and we'll have limited time for Q&A. So if you have any questions, uh, I would encourage you to go ahead and still put them in the question section of the control panel and we can have the presenter reach out to you directly or of course you could reach out to the presenter directly uh, with the contact information that they share. Um, and if you have any questions for the webinar administrator, uh, you can put those in the question section of the control panel as well. So with that, uh, I can go ahead and turn it over to John to begin today's presentation. John? Uh, thanks, Scott, I appreciate it. So uh, as Scott mentioned, my name is John Bazone. I've been with uh, Duo of uh, Dallas Cisco for, for four years, and I'm gonna be taking us through some fundamental concepts around zero trust. And joining me is uh, Jim Darty, who is my SE, and Jim will be offering some color commentary and uh, you know, basically presenting any salient points that I may have missed. And then most importantly, Greg Went, who's the executive director at Appsian, is going to be rounding out the discussion, talking about some specific use cases around PeopleSoft, and then doing a bit of a, a demo. So what we're going to talk about today, um, you know, we, it is our hope that um, this you know, leads to more questions and to more rich discussions that we might be able to continue sometime after this presentation. But really, we want to give you a, a great foundational understanding of, of how we view zero trust. Um, how how we can you are know, basically offering some of the challenges around um, how how that's done within PeopleSoft, and then finally how we you know diminish or remove the impediments to adaptation and and really make sure that there's an excellent user experience. But before we do that, I kind of want to talk through you know what are some of the challenges with with the modern day perimeter, right? How are things changing, right? And now we have we have remote users, remote workforce. We have uh, contractors, we have SaaS applications, we, we're extending on-prem applications uh, you know, to the cloud. We, we have our SaaS providers, IoT, BYOD. So effectively, that's just really increasing our threat grid. And the challenge is, is how do I, not only how do I secure that environment, but then I really have to think in the context of how, how do I secure the environment without in, impeding uh, company mission and you know, creating or, or you know, not creating a bad user experience. And that's not easily done. So I talked about the threat grid and, and where are those threats really coming from today? Attackers are targeting identity, they're targeting apps and devices, right? So we, we need a holistic approach of, of, of how we're gonna shore up that security. And if we look at 81% of breaches uh, that's coming from Verizon um, are from comp comprom compromised credentials. And then in the context of, of web apps, 54% um, of those have uh, public exploits. And then we look at IoT devices, BYOD. It's not just good enough to verify, verify users, but we really need to look at the health and, and, and the health and hygiene of devices, scrutinize those uh, because they can offer you know, just as many vulnerabilities. And it's no surprise that PeopleSoft is, is, a, is a top target, right? It houses you know, some of your, your company's most sensitive information. And if I look at these metrics and then kind of correlate them to uh, talking about, you know, username and password security models, you know, 88% of IT professionals said that any type of breach of, the, of an ERP system would be catastrophic. And yet over a two-year period, IT executives said that 64% of those surveyed said it's already happened. So, <laughs> so catastrophe has already trans transpired. And if we look at the, the, the means and methodologies for attackers and, and how they gain that access, it's, it's typically through some type of uh, phishing or steering attack. So all that really correlates to the, the whole username and password as the primary methodology for security is just inept, right? And we really need to adopt uh, new and distinct challenges to, to address, that, you know, address, that, address those challenges. So uh, what do we do? A zero trust approach. So first is it's really drawing the distinction between what is the traditional approach versus um, you know, what do we mean by zero trust? 
And as I said earlier, with all these different vectors coming in to access your, um, you know, these access points uh, to your applications and ultimately your data, you know, in the past we were really very much so self-contained, and and trust and that you know, it was based upon network, you know, location. And once hackers it, or an attacker compromised that, they had complete and utter and lateral movement behind the firewall. And this really didn't account for the modernization of the perimeter, as you mentioned, BYOD and, and all those different access points, um, you know, specifically cloud and, and uh, your, you know, your SaaS applications. So from a zero trust perspective, what we're really saying is that irrespective of the network location, every single request for access um, will be met with verification of the user and looking at the health and the hygiene of the device, then applying policy to say what what you know access privileges that you have, and the most important thing is that it extends itself. It creates a better security model. But as I was saying earlier, it's also operating on the on you know another access, which is essentially saying this is giving us business agility. If I have the ability then to bring any device and I can scrutinize the, the health and hygiene of that device, irrespective of whether it's managed or not, that really um, gives me a comprehensive DYOD strategy. It gives me business agility. But it also delivers on really giving me that that mature security model that that really represents the modern perimeter. So, um, as I mentioned, uh, Duo is now part of Cisco. Um, so we're part of a, a larger ecosystem. So when we talk about zero trust, we really kind of have three three pillars um, today. Um, I'm not going to go on a tangential discussion on on workload or, or workplace. Uh, we're, we're really focused on Duo as relates to user and device access at the session level and, and, and the security that we put forth there. But if we look at, you know, um, ex extending the zero trust journey, um, looking at workloads and workload segmentation more specifically, and then also pro from a workplace perspective, locking down, um, you know, IoT and uh, Wi-Fi, so locking down that campus, giving, um, defining least, least privilege access, there's a broader story there. And I really think, um, and once again, uh, this is really part of another conversation, but I invite you, um, if, if, you're, if you're curious, one of the best kept secrets in the industry is, is the extent of the offerings uh, within the, you know, and integrated offerings from Cisco, and, and specifically around security and the orchestration and the, in, the integration of, of those technologies is, is very mature and very compelling. So that is my uh, shameless plug and invite you to look at that. But once again, I'm going to get back on track, and we're really just going to focus on Duo for the workforce. So how do we deliver zero trust for the workforce? And some of the concepts might seem repetitive, but I think it's important because if you just walk away with user, device, and policy, and that's all you walk away with in, in today's interaction, um, that, that, that's a win, right, in, in, in terms of, you know, getting that foundational understanding. But effectively, it's it's really like the three three legs of a tripod, right? And we look at you know multi-factor as being a foundational piece. Um, so the identifying the user, scrutinizing the health and the hygiene of the device, and then really having unique and adaptive policies that that you define, right? So far be it from us to define what your threshold for risk is. Um, we give you the ability to define that in the context of of our tools, and you can make sure that at that session level when that request for access exists that all the checkboxes in real time are being hit and that you, you're, you're protected. And I think that's a, um, a really a differentiator for, for Duo in, in the marketplace. I think, um, and let me, let me progress here because we're going to talk about, you know, these three pillars, if you will, in a little bit more uh, in depth, but specifically around zero trust and, and MFA. And I think there's a lot of um, distraction in, in, you know, in the market because there's, there's, uh, 30 odd providers of multi-factor technology in some way, shape, or form. Um, but if, if I, I've always used the analogy, if we were to put them in Times Square and call that MFA Central, um, as those as those companies depart from from that uh, point, they they go in radically different directions. So you may have identity providers that happen to have an MFA technology or a platform provider that um, it's not really a focal point, but um, they're providing that as a as a as a value add. The differentiation here is that we're not an MFA company, we're a security company, and we were purpose-built um, around zero trust and uh, around those principles, right? So we, we pur purposely want to be identity agnostic, um, so we work with all the top identity providers very seamlessly, and we, MFA is the foundation for the, the zero trust journey. 
But even in the realm of MFA, we're able to really um, do some very unique things. We invented we invented push, uh, which is leveraging something you have in your phone. And some of our earlier successes really came from um, getting people off of tokens where man in the middle style attacks um, were a threat. Uh, so coming over that separate channel uh, provided uh, enhanced security. But um, the other the other elements that really um, uh, contributed to that success was the fact that we could diminish time to security. So the user experience, so the average user enrollment is, is about five minutes. Um, in terms of the native native integrations, um, the common experience in you know whether it's on prem in the cloud. So diminishing, creating a, a better security model, but also really eliminating the barriers to adaptation and also lowering the total cost of ownership from an administrative perspective. That that kind of led to our success and. I just want to draw those distinctions if we're kind of operating in a vacuum and just looking at MFA. Um, I thought that would be good to note, but kind of getting this back on the zero trust, this is the first step in terms of scrutinizing or, or rather verifying the user, and we have a very elegant way to do that. You'll notice too that there's a lot of contextual information that we provide uh, in that login, um, and you can customize that. And so there's a lot of information there in terms of not just a check or an X, um, is this is this a valid transaction or not? Where is this coming from? Um, you know, what network is this coming over? What application time, et cetera? So you can really make a, a contextual and informed decision on on how you do uh, multi-factor. So the the second uh, second leg of that tripod is really device trust, and this is something that uh, once again sets us apart because. We have the ability to um, scrutinize the health and the hygiene of a device without the use of an agent. And it's very compelling because, and especially now, it's, it's even really become more, uh, I hate mentioning the word COVID because I know it's such a downer and it's, it's, it's been you know, overused, but, but that's the only time I'll use it. Um, if, if we talk about that in the context of remote workforce, um, you may have had 25, a company may have had 25 to 35% of their employees being remote and quickly pivoted to you know 90 or 95 percent and so device trust has always been important but now uh, companies were scrambling because they didn't really have a, a mature byod strategy so how do i have visibility into unmanaged devices um, now i have all these remote employees and and they're introducing this to this device and i don't know i don't even know what that looks like i don't know how to apply policy to that so effectively, what we've done is, once again, verifying the user, we can look at the health and hygiene of the device. And we also have a, a, a great way to remediate, right? So the last thing we want to do, we want to enforce security policy, but the users need to be able to do their job productively. We don't want to generate a help desk ticket. So effectively, um, we give you the means to, uh, to, you know, for that user to remediate right there with the instructions. So examples, somebody might be three OS patches back. This, this exceeds your risk threshold. So you can block that access. And then there's gonna be um, basically a box with that context of you need to go and, and update your OS and here's the instructions and here's where you can do that. So it's really that, that whole idea of uh, self-service, self-remediation, enforcing security policy um, is, is great. And then we can look at things, um, you know, very dangerous things. What if we have a jailbroken device out there? We wanna block that, you know, block that immediately. So that whole idea of, of uh, device security posture is, is really critical in a, in a zero trust framework. So we want to protect every application, or at least the extent of the applications that you deem to be um, critical, or you don't want to be compromised. And I think I mentioned this earlier, but what we really, um, one of the things that's lent, lent itself to our, our success is the fact that we really uh, integrate out of the box with a myriad of applications and we have the ability um, if applications are, are using industry standards like saml and it's not a native integration we do have an sdk which is a few lines of code but effectively um, all of the uh, top you know messaging vpn uh, identity providers um, this is not a heavy lift for us right so once again we're diminishing that time to security because you, you can you can effectively go look at these applications at you know as targets and and uh, get there you know pretty quickly and as I mentioned from the user experience um, it's 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 pretty quick to you know five minutes to download the app and so we can get you up and running uh, you know very rapidly. And I talked about adaptive policy um, as part of that is so this is kind of the third you know the the, the third um, leg of that tripod and when we talk about adaptive policy. 
once again, it's, it's really you customizing that um, to your security threshold. But then how, it's, it's not even so much the what, it's, it's the how. You may make distinctions between this should be a global policy or I'm only gonna apply this policy for this application or if I can do that at the, at the group level. So there's flexibility in terms of, of how you enforce that policy. And then, um, you know, kind of pivoting away from just device insight, we look at, you know, a specific network policy. So we might be able to, might want to block anybody trying to come over a tour network. Or if we look at, you know, geo, uh, you know, geolocation, right? So if something's coming over from North Korea, um, maybe we just want to block that out, right? So we can, we can blacklist, the, you know, those, those IP ranges. Um, so really giving you the ability once again to, um, you know, so it's, it's not so much, you know, what you're doing, it's, it's how you're doing it and how do I customize that um, in terms of the context of my organization and my risk profile. So um, I hope that was informative. Um, and as I said, I just wanted to get some foundational, you know, concepts going. I think what I want to do now, um, and I think uh, Greg is going to take over and uh, talk about some, some specific use cases and then a demo and, and, you know, hopefully this neatly ties that together in terms of some of the foundational concepts, capabilities, and then we can talk specifically around um, you know, Duo and how we support, uh, you know, Axiom more, more specifically with PeopleSoft. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today and uh, look forward to your questions via the chat. Take care. Thanks, John. And as you said, my name is Greg Wendt. I'm the executive director of the security solution here at Appsian. Um, I've been working with the, the Duo integration for my whole time here. So I'm, I've just been about with Appsian for about, or Appsian for about seven years, just under seven years. So um, with that, I've worked with Duo the whole time. So it's something that we've embedded into the application from a really early start. And, and a lot of that is based upon those zero trust policies. So when we, when we think about what you want to do inside of an application. There's different examples. There's different reasons for why you want to be able to do these um, different functions of bringing in that zero trust, the integration with multi-factor, and really decide when and where to challenge a user inside of the application. So typically, when we talk about a couple of different examples, one of them is going to be a trusted IP range. And, and by that, what ends up looking for the users is if I'm on a trusted network, you know, John brought up the fact of COVID. A lot of people are outside of the network now, and it really is a big, giant change. When, but when you're sitting at your desk, should I have to go through um, a challenge? Should I have to go through Duo, for example? And a, and a lot of times, from an implementation perspective, you don't want to. So that's one of the things that we see a lot of um, organizations do. So, you know, it, it's implementing that challenge when and where somebody is attempting to do something based upon the risks and how they're accessing the system. So when we think about it from an unknown IP range, basically you've got your trusted range that you're controlling and in the outside range, you know, everybody else <laughs> from that perspective. So, um, you know, at that particular point, uh, we want to inject a duo challenge inside of, of the system so that that user has to go through that stepped up authentication to reach the PeopleSoft system or maybe a page or a component or a transaction inside of the system. And then when we think about high privileged users, they're kind of a, a group of their own. Uh, they should always be treated a little bit differently. And I kind of think of, you know, when we define a high privileged user, especially within an ERP system, to me, it's anybody and everybody who has something besides just self-service access. So if you think about in the realm of PeopleSoft, for example, there's, you may have thousands of users that just have access to their own information. But when you're thinking about the high privileged ones, obviously, it's all the developers, the QAs, testers, um, those type of personnel, as well as the, the users inside of the application doing the core business functions that you're doing. It could be anything from you know financials to HCM benefits, payroll, any of those types of things where you've got access to corporate level data outside of just maybe single records of yourself. So that's the way I would kind of define a high privileged user. And at that particular point, anytime somebody's attempting to act in that role, you definitely want them to have to go through that stepped up authentication to be able to access that particular data, transaction, anything inside of the application. So when we talk about how we're able to do this from a protection of the application, we have a plug-in, our application security platform that plugs into the PeopleSoft system 
And what we have done is we've created and built all of the interfaces and communication necessary to implement Duo without having to do any sort of modification to your PeopleSoft system. So it allows you to bring in any of those challenges exactly where you want them to happen from a security flow inside of the application set itself. That could be menu component page level access inside of PeopleSoft. It can be all the way down to a field level access if you want to do that, but it's leveraging um, the Duo, Duo setup configuration to integrate that into the application without you as a customer having to modify any of the PeopleSoft system. It's very streamlined. The plugin makes it to where the users don't leave the PeopleSoft system. It's embedded in to the application set and makes it very streamlined and efficient to see the flow moving through um, the, the transactions and the access of the system. So with that, I think let's, let's go ahead and demo because I think a, a demo makes it real easy to understand um, how this is done. So what I want to do is talk about a couple of different scenarios. So I'm going to log in as a standard self-service user inside of the PeopleSoft system, thinking about them working with um, their setup, their information. All I can access is my self-service. So I can go look at my benefits, maybe paycheck, payroll, um, update my banking information, benefits, those types of things. So it's, it's targeted towards me as an individual user. So when I access that way, um, obviously, there's certain content that I may or may not have to go through um, a uh, stepped up authentication. And that's really where the zero trust comes in. So if you Im implement certain masking and protection of the data, for example, then there are certain transactions and fields that users can access those pages without having to go through um, a challenge at that particular point. But I can show you a quick example under personal details of some of those masking um, once that comes up, I'll drop into additional information so you can see some of the masking at that particular layer. That's what I'm talking about of we, we've now, because of where the user is coming from, protecting that data. But when you're talking about rolling out self-service transactions, especially when all of your employees are at home, um, access is going to be totally different. Now, they, I need to have them verify. You know, I need them to go through a stepped up trust at that particular point. So this is an example of what we would call a very targeted um, stepped up authentication. So at this point, what we're doing is protecting the account number inside of the direct deposit field. Regardless of who's accessing the system, we're going to go ahead and protect that the account number. If I want to access it, I'm going to go ahead and click that. You can see that it said, you know, unlock via multi-factor. So here's where you're going to see the Duo dialog built directly in. I'm going to go ahead and approve that on my phone, and it's going to drop me in, and now I've got access to update that account number and make any changes that I need to do. That's what we're talking about with Zero Trust, very targeted implementation of if somebody needs to update this particular piece of information, they're going to have to do it right at the point in time inside of the transaction, inside of the application set, very targeted um, from a from a you know access point and security implementation. The nice part about this is once the user does pass the stepped up authentication, they they don't have to do it again. So if there's another area inside of the application that you're trying to protect, once they pass it once, you can you can go ahead and allow them access to all the other parts of the transaction. Um, something that we see and, and we kind of recommend as well is what happens when I have, let's go to those high privileged users or PeopleSoft admin. Obviously, they're going to have two different types of access points. Um, and with that, they might have a, a user ID that's obviously their own that grants them access to say self-service like Vicky's in here. The other role or access ID could be that high privilege role, especially when you're talking about a PeopleSoft administrator. When you're talking about um, maybe a high privileged user, they typically don't have two different IDs. So it might be the transition between that self-service and high privileged area of the application that is where the delineating factor of where you implement the multi-factor authentication is. So, but let's say I was an enterprise architect, so inside of production, I didn't have anything you know, besides self-service because I couldn't do anything. I wasn't a functional user. Um, so for me, 
if I wanted to access um, some of my normal uh, PeopleSoft admin style access, one of the things that we've done is built a privileged account switcher to where I can then switch into my super user account. So I've logged in, I've done all of my access under that particular you know, self-service style account that, that I needed to be able to do, but now I can switch into that higher privileged um, role. And you can see at that particular point as well, we can go ahead and inject that security of it. So now to be able to access that role, I have to go through that stepped up authentication. I'm gonna go ahead and approve this real quick. And once I do, I'm and now in the application and I'm able to do whatever function I have to do in my stepped up role. And that could be whatever you know admins need to do at that particular point. So that allows me to go through, um, step up, prove who I am going with that zero trust model. So once I'm done doing whatever function I need to do, I can actually switch back to my normal self at that particular point in time. And now I'm back in as my self-service role that doesn't have access to those higher privileged um, pages and components and things like that. I'm going to go ahead and sign out here real quick. I'm going to sign in. Um, as a high privileged user. So let's say that uh, I'm coming in as the, the PS, the most highest privileged account delivered inside of PeopleSoft. Once again, you're gonna see that I'm gonna have to immediately um, pass a multi-factor challenge um, to prove who I am at that point, because this account is so powerful within the ERP system. I wanna make sure that's protected and that's all configurable as to how you do that. So upon login for that account, I'm gonna go ahead and challenge them I'm going to sign out. I'm going to come in as that other scenario of that high privileged user. That high privileged user, maybe they're going to drop in and we're going to look at manager or self service information, those types of things. But once I start to transition into performing actions that are considered high privileged, you know, keep in mind what I was talking about earlier with that definition of high privileged is accessing information really that's corporate outside of, of just my employee records. And one of the things that we find needs a lot of protection is really the reporting tools and, and built specifically around like query. Uh, if you do have an organ, if somebody in the organization fall for a phishing attack and somebody's accessing your system, you want to make sure query is protected because that's an area where you can extra exfiltrate a lot of information very quickly. So I'm going to try to access the query manager, for example. You're going to see at that particular point, I'm accessing something that is very high privileged and it's something that needs to be protected and at that particular point you know you have to prove who you are so let me do that push notification i'll approve that and it's going to drop me right into the query manager so from a usability flow you can see from interacting with the customers or with your employees that you can target exactly the point in time of where it's necessary that you want to have that that um, increased authentication challenge injected. So without having to customize your PeopleSoft system, it's very easy to bring it in. You can do it you know, inside of a transaction at a field level event. And you can do it inside of a menu component page level if somebody's accessing a particular part of the application, or you can even do it based upon roles, user IDs. If you want to target somebody specifically, you know, maybe an admin DBA, DBA role, somebody who has, you know, really increased um, privileges inside of the system that, you know, if, if a hacker gets a hold of those admin level credentials, you could really be in trouble. So that's one of the things that I wanted to demo was show how easy it was to integrate with Duo into the PeopleSoft system, bringing it into those transactions and in implementing that for the end users very, very seamlessly and streamlined. So um, with that, um, John, I'll bring it back so um, you can wrap up and talk a little bit about um, the two of us together. Ah, thanks, Greg. So um, thank you for the, uh, can, can you hear me, Greg, by the way? I just, uh, I had a, yep. Issues. Sure can. Okay. Perfect. So, um, it, you know, in closing, um, really just demonstrating seamless, seamless zero trust integration with PeopleSoft, and and really at Appsian making those extensions, and then Duo, Duo providing those functions around users and and devices, and then once again that that adaptive uh, policy with with your specific risk profile in place um, is, is very compelling. I and mean, we talked about. Some of the challenges and and the the, the quality and of or, or rather the importance of the data that you're trying to protect within these ERP systems, and really being able to diminish the time to security 
it's a very compelling message. Uh, message. So, um, so that that would be uh, that would be my thoughts there in terms of uh, wrapping up. And uh, is there is there anything else that you want to provide, Craig? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely can echo what John's saying. When we when we look at how our customers have been extremely su successful um, implementing the the shared technologies between us, it has been very quick go lives, um, and they've really seen a large return on their investments because it does allow them to leverage additional functionality because they can implement those step up authentications at the transaction level where and when it's important inside of the application so um, it's a win-win on both sides um, very quick robust implementations and allows your organization to, to really reach that ROI level that you want to inside these ERP level applications yeah well said so with that, I think we can we can bring in um, Scott. Are you going to um, do a little management of the Q and A? Sure, will. And yeah, I would just like to remind everyone that if you do have a question, you can certainly put that in the questions section of the control panel. It's on the right side of your screen. Uh, first and foremost, I think this might be a question for Greg, and that's um, if you're trying to deploy MFA challenges only to users coming in on mobile devices. Is that possible? Uh, yes, that's actually a pretty frequent question that we've gotten here um, lately. And, and yes, that's possible. Um, what we do is we can take um, a lot of different conditions or context into place um, to decide whether or not we should apply the, the challenge to that user or not. And, and definitely mobile devices is one of them. We can look at a lot of additional attributes outside of, say, PeopleSoft and pull them in and use them to decide whether or not to apply or that user needs to apply for or, and pass that stepped up authentication. Okay, very good. Um, this is probably a question for John. I think you touched on it a little bit, but this is coming up frequently. And that's um, if Duo has a plugin for PeopleSoft, and if so, what is that? Oh, well, well, really, uh, Appian has really been our, our partner in that regard, um, and it's not so much a limitation in, in Duo. It's just um, PeopleSoft really wasn't, you know, architected for um, for for a lot of these security security methodologies. So so AppScene is really the vehicle to to expose that logic. So you can leverage something like Duo for for uh, for zero trust. Um, so a lot of the quote unquote integrations with PeopleSoft um, natively are, are pretty limited as pertains to Duo. And I think that's not really a, a duo issue per se. That's I think that's true of, of most uh, you know multi-factor providers or anyone that's trying to tackle zero trust. And, and that's why Action has been such a critical partner for us and uh, worked uh, together at a really large healthcare company um, in the East Coast. And unfortunately, can't mention their, their name under non-disclosure. But uh, the first application was for 33,000 users, and they wanted to uh, tackle PeopleSoft, right? So Action was just really critical in exposing that logic. Um, you know the, the, the V frame and being able to to leverage all the capabilities of Duo. So so that's that's why and it's part of the reason why we're here today. If that makes sense. Awesome. All right, Greg. I think this one's for you. Uh, how does life cycle affect the Appsian product? Can it be implemented in development environments? Is it, it and is it uh, migratable? Uh, yes, definitely. So um, the lifecycle management is definitely something inside of PeopleSoft. Being an enterprise architect, uh, as I was for about 20 years of PeopleSoft, I, I understand the concerns there. Um, we do plug into the web server. So if you do a PeopleTools update and you redeploy the PIA, the PeopleSoft Internet Architecture, you would have to redeploy our plugin. Uh, the, the project We've got a project that goes into the database. It's a bolt-on project. We do not deliver any objects that, that PeopleSoft works with. Um, so it's all of our own custom objects, and what that does is it stores all of the all of the policies inside of the PeopleSoft system. So you can configure it all inside of PeopleSoft, very streamlined, very efficient. Um, and, and yes, it's all migratable. You can use data mover scripts that we give you to um, move them back and forth. And you know, is this implemented in development? It, very frequently. Uh, it's something that, especially depending upon from a recommendation perspective, if your development environments are full copy of production data or even partially full copy of production data, then yes, I would definitely stress that you implement this inside of your development systems. 
Awesome. All right, John, here we go. Uh, one of your customers, uh, we are already licensed with Duo and working on a POC to expose PeopleSoft outside the network, a super common use case. Uh, can we implement AppSean uh, after the POC? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I'd probably just take that offline and just coordinate the appropriate AppSean resources. But um, yeah, and and we've done joint POCs with with AppSean, and and obviously as as, as Greg has demonstrated today, uh, they're very into they have very intimate knowledge with uh, with with our tool. So um, yeah, I'll you know provide you my contact information offline, but happy to help with that. Cool. Okay, I think this one might be a Greg. Um, how does the functionality handle PeopleSoft delegations, uh, the delegations functionality while using Duo security? That's a good question. Um, so it, what it, what we do is we're going to look to see um, and pull the operator ID that's signed in and tie them into um, the the Duo domain. So if, if that particular user, um, let's say, I'm assuming that they're probably talking about maybe campus solutions or something like that but with the delegation. And that's frequently where it's used. If if the you know somebody grants delegation to that particular user, um, what it's going to do is it's going to tie back to the user ID that's currently signed in. Sometimes the, some of the delegations will um, they kind of fake that it's the, that it's acting as the particular student with, with different security profiles. So um, when you look at our delegation process, our you know kind of the way we work with that. Um, we're going to tie back to the particular account that signed in. So what's going to happen there is I'm not quite a hundred percent sure on the delegation. If it creates an upper def and row or not, if it doesn't, then it would be tied to the original student or that delegated account is where the, where the duo would be tied to, I believe. Okay, great. Uh, Greg, another one for you. Um, and how does AppSean support the SSL enabled PeopleSoft environment? Um, it's actually fully supported. Um, we support any of the environments because of the way we plug in. Um, sometimes some organizations do SSL termination that's on their load balancer. Sometimes it's at the web server layer. Um, whatever configuration you have set up, we fully support. Okay. Uh, this is a good question. I'm not sure who to give it to. So I'm, I'm going to just toss it out and, and let you guys fight over it. But this, this is a good one. Um, from an organizational perspective, how can the plug-in – Absium, be trusted. How can we make sure that the plugin itself cannot be compromised? And by that, I'm, I'd, I'd almost ask a secondary question. Um, I'm wondering if they're talking about the Duo plugin, like the interface with the push notification, or our plugin. Um, what happens with um, ours is we communicate directly to Duo, and pretty much that's all SSL. John could probably give additional information in there, but because of the way um, that is delivered down to the client, uh, it, it is extremely secure, very tightly um, in integrated from what's coming from Duo. There, there's really no insight into what's happening or little insight into what's happening inside of the Duo push notification window because of the securities that are implemented there. I'm sure John or or, or maybe even Jim have some additional information or thoughts there as well. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, I, I can I can definitely, um, you know, coordinate with, with product on uh, those, you know, that specific, uh, you know, that integration, that, that security and, and um, how we lock that down. But really uh, at, a, at a more macro level um, from the actual, um, you know, push notification coming over a separate channel, we're not storing, um, you know, any, any information. So even if, if somebody were to um, break into, uh, you know, get, get through to duo. There's, there's nothing, there's, there's no man in the middle style attacks that, that can, you know, occur. And effectively there's no information that, that really could be compromised. So that, that whole process is, is pretty secure and well documented, but I think it's a great question and I'll take that as a, uh, as it's due, um, you know, as pertains to, uh, you know, the actual integration itself. And I can just add a little bit of color there as well. Um, can you hear me, John? Yep. Certainly. Yeah, so this is, this is Jim Doherty from uh, from Duo, um, and I agree um, with what Greg said. Uh, you know, I'd, ideally, there'd be a follow up question to understand the context uh, more specifically. But if we want to talk about Duo security from an admin perspective, 
um, you know, that can be secured in a number of different ways, including SSO. So you're able to tie into what you're using as an organization that way. And then within the confines of the console, we have full support for RBAC-based controls, so role-based controls. So um, you can allow or uh, deny discrete permissions in terms of who can add an application like Appsian um, and who can do other things with respect to uh, configuring Duo with any other applications. In addition, everything that an admin does within the console is going to be logged, so there's full audit capability and tracking there in terms of any changes that are made to um, you know, your application inventory within Duo, specific policies, user creation, um, et cetera, et cetera. So hopefully that, that adds a little color as well. Okay, great. Uh, we're getting close here, so this may be the last one, and I will probably hand this one over to John or Jim, um, whoever would like to take it. Uh, but since Duo is tied to a mobile device, uh, what can be done about SIM jacking attacks? Yep, Jim, I was yeah, pretty so, on that. Yeah, so for be, because not all things are equal, we we provide a lot of flexibility with respect to you may want to use in your environment. So you have the ability to turn off SMS for uh, as a 2FA method or phone calls. Uh, you know, ultimately those channels don't hold up quite as well as newer two mechanisms and, and organizations like NIST have pointed that out now for a number of years. Um, so there are um, mechanisms that would certainly be considered more secure. And, and as a general rule, uh, our guidance as a state company uh, would be to, um, you know, to some other mechanisms. Um, um, you know, otherwise, you know, you do have policies to sort of limit the scope based on use case and based on your users um, to, to be able to use those methods. Okay. Uh, very good. Uh, let me see. I'm doing a quick. There's so many good questions here. We could be here for another 30 minutes. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, I, I think we probably need to to wrap it up. Um, but I, I would like to thank uh, John, Jim, and Greg. Thank you guys so much. Uh, it's been a great session. Um, I would like to encourage everyone to learn more about Duo and the, the duo Appsian relationship. Um, you can go to Duo's website at duo.com. Uh, every presenter was handpicked by us, so I know you'll definitely benefit from learning more about how they can help uh, you guys innovate PeopleSoft. And lastly, I, I would like to mention, uh, I would be remiss if uh, I didn't mention that uh, future PeopleSoft innovation summits are currently being planned. So uh, we'll be sure to send out a survey on Friday and we would certainly appreciate all of your feedback uh, for, for the week's event here. And uh, we'd also like to encourage you to follow Appsian on LinkedIn and Twitter, uh, so you can certainly be the first to learn about future events. And of course, you can find us at uh, www.appsian.com. So uh, with that, uh, we will have another session here in about 15 minutes, uh, PeopleSoft or People SaaS techniques for running PeopleSoft like a SaaS application is up next. So you can certainly still sign up for that on the landing page that you signed up for this session. And uh, until then, hope you stick around and we'll see you again here in a few minutes. Bye-bye.